Right guys, so today we're going to be doing an LS400 98-2000, so it's a 1UZ VVTi. This is going into an IS200 and it's going to be plug and play using a manual gearbox. So, let's get into it. Right guys, so as I said, it is going to be a 1UZ BVTi from an LS400 from a 98 to 2000 model going into an IS200. It is going to be completely plug and play and it's using a manual gearbox. Now, you can see we have literally the entire engine bay harness from the IS200. This was one that was originally already swapped over to a 1UZ uh, done by somebody else. So obviously we couldn't make our plug and play harness. So we've actually had to hardwire the entire thing into the actual engine bay harness. All right, so first thing I'm going to do is we're going to go through some pictures, show you what we've done with the engine harness. Obviously, we've completely stripped that down, uh, got rid of everything that's not needed, added in what is needed. And obviously, we've done a lot of work with the ECU box over there to correct everything that was changed and make it all um, hardwired into the vehicle. So let's do that now. Back in a second. Right, so you can see there we've stripped the whole thing down, repair what needs repairing, remove what needs removing, added what needs adding, etc. And we've fixed up all of that. Um, what you'll see at the end of the video is what we received. So you'll see all of the mess that was going on in there. And then obviously how it looks now that we fixed it all. Okay, so what we're going to do today is the same as any of our other videos. We're going to go through the layout of the engine harness so the customer knows where everything goes in. Uh, we'll go through, through some things we've done on the actual engine harness because of a fault that occurred, which is the reason that the harness was actually brought to us to be corrected. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll go into the testing. So that's going to be testing with the ignition on and testing with the engine running. There are going to be some differences from our normal one because there's certain things we can't interface with, but I'll go through that at the time. Okay. Right. So starting with the layout in the ECU box over here. So what you're going to notice that's different from what we normally have is you're going to see that everything looks like it comes from factory like this. So all of these three plugs that would normally well, these two plugs that would normally be in the IS200 and go to our patch on us, well, now they're hardwired into the vehicle. So we've moved all the pins around and added in what we needed to add in. Obviously, this one is exactly the same. We've then obviously added in what needed added in and repinned what needed repinning and re-terminated what needed re-terminating. So these wires will always stay inside the vehicle. Okay, moving on to the engine harness itself, we have our usual three plugs in there. So obviously this one now just has the Atomu device going into it, and that's obviously because we are running a manual, so we need the Atomu device to emulate all the transmission signals so the ECU stays happy, okay? In terms of the body side, in this case, we're gonna have one extra plug. So we've got our normal gray plug, our blue plug, and our black plug, so that's all standard IS200. Uh, we've kept that all original, so nothing is deviated from an IS200. What we have had to add is this little 8-pin DTM connector. So the bottom half, that stays with the vehicle. The top half stays with the engine harness. So that is where we pass signals through that are required to go into these three body plugs that come from the engine harness itself. And tucked away neatly down in there, you're going to see the MPX device. So that's going to convert the MPX data from the 1UZ to the IS200. And we have got that working. So we've got a little dash on here so we can show that all the MPX data is working correctly. And you'll see that as part of the testing process. Okay. So again, it's really nice and simple in this case. If you pull the engine harness out, you're going to have these three plugs that are going to come with the engine harness. You're going to have those three body plugs and that one DTM connector, and that'll make the whole engine harness come apart and you'll be able to take the engine out of the vehicle. These will all remain behind as if it was like a standard vehicle and obviously go from there. So from there, we then have our grommet that slides into there. Remember, obviously, there'll be a lid on top of this. And what we've done is there's actually a gap underneath there that you can push this DTM plug through. So that makes that all nice and neat there as well. Coming along from there, we then have a little junction connector, which we keep taped up over there. And then it's gonna run along to the piece of rubber that's over here. 
and then move over to the plastic at the back of the engine, okay? Now, again, this is actually a three UZ engine, not a one UZ engine, so the mounting points are missing. So the water bridge at the back of a one UZ VVTi is different from a three UZ. So in this case, you'll see we have a mounting point here, which would be on the water bridge normally. We have a mounting point over there, see if I can focus it, but you can see down there. And then lastly, the mounting point that it shares with the 3UZ is that mounting point over there. So that's what mounts this piece of plastic to the back of the engine, okay? Right, so from here, what we're gonna do first is come up here and then we'll come back and make our way around there. So coming up here, we're gonna go over the top of the fuel pulsation damper. This is your fuel line that comes in. And then we get to the next piece of plastic that's keeping the harness all together. That has two mounting points there and there, and that's exactly the same whether it's 1UZ or 3UZ. No changes there whatsoever, okay? Now then, the first section that comes out over here is going to go to an ejector seven and coil seven. So while I'm here, I'm just going to do a quick cap for you, a recap for you. Or well, not a recap, but just explain to you. With this engine, this is the left bank. So you're always looking from the driver's side. This is the left bank. That's the right bank. The left bank has cylinder one, three, five, and seven. And the right bank has cylinder two, four, six, and eight. They can also be referred to as bank one and bank two. And the easy way to tell is bank one has cylinder one, bank two has cylinder two. Super easy. Okay. So either left or right or one and two. Right. So, yeah, the first breakout there is going to be in ejector 7 and coil 7. And what you might notice that you've seen an original one user VBTI harness is normally coil 7 comes out here and then goes along there to there. For some reason, they did that. And then on the 3UZ, they changed to this system. So we changed the 1UZ to the same way as the 3UZ is. So it makes it super nice and easy when you're putting stuff together that you don't mix these two coils up because that has happened before. So it definitely can happen. Okay, so that's your first section there, injector seven, coil seven. The next section that pops out over here is gonna be injector five and coil five, nice and simple. The next section that pops out here is gonna be injector three, coil three, and then the first of the three cam sensors. So this is the cam sensor that's monitoring the left bank cam. There's a three lobe in, so a three teeth in here that this is measuring. So that's designed to measure the angle of the cam based on what the VVTI is commanding. So that's called normally VVL. Uh, or VV left bank. Again, just measuring for the ECU what the camshaft is doing based on the commands from the ECU, okay? After that, we come out to the front here and then we're gonna have our noise filter. So your noise filters tend to look like this. They just bolt onto the intake somewhere. And basically this is a noise filter that stops electrical noise from the ignition and injection system. So obviously the injectors and the coils are pulsing. This is a capacitor in here. It takes the 12 volt feed from those and it just suppresses that so no electromagnetic interference is coming through. Okay, right. Moving along to the front over here, we're then gonna break out for injector one and coil one. We're also gonna break out for oil control valve for the left bank. So this is how the VVTI is controlled with an oil control valve. And this is the two pin plug for that, okay? It's gonna move a tiny bit more forward and then we're gonna end up with our TPS connector. So you might say, Chris, it looks nothing like a TPS connector for a Toyota and you'd be absolutely right. You can see down in there if I move that out the way, but you can actually see there's your TPS and underneath there, is the actual connector that you would be used to on a Toyota with a TPS. So this is just a sub harness that they've built because obviously trying to get access to that plug at the bottom is really painful. So this just runs down underneath and goes to the TPS. So you're interfacing with that plug over there, okay? The second thing that comes out there is gonna go all the way across to over there and it's gonna go to our accelerator pedal position sensor, okay? That's that thing over there, right? So remember, these were the first of the drive-by-wire design. So yes, you still had a physical cable that attached to here but this doesn't actually attach to the throttle body completely. So you can see here, there's no noise from the throttle body at all, but if I go right to the end, that's why you're here when people explain, I've only got throttle when I put, the throttle foot, when I put my foot flat to the floor. That's basically what's happening. Their throttle motor is shut down because some sort of fail safe, and they've got no accelerator from there. And then at the end, you've got a teeny, teeny little bit of accelerator movement and that's to create a limp home mode so you can actually just limp the vehicle to a workshop or your home or wherever and get the problem sorted out, okay? So remember, these can often be referred to as what they call the clutched style system. And I'm gonna to get to that in a second when we move along, but the harness is gonna carry on down through under the throttle and brake up over here. It's gonna to go to the cam sensor. So this is the cam sensor at the front of the engine. This is measuring the engine movement in, term, in relation to the crank. So this is how the ECU is running fully sequential because it's got a 36 minus two trigger wheel on the crank and it's got a single tooth on this cam. But this cam doesn't move with the VVTi. So this is a solid position sensor that the engine can use to tell when to fire the spark plugs and the injectors on a fully sequential basis, okay? Single tooth on there. 
three teeth on the two inlet cams, which we get to the other side over there, and 36 minus two trigger on the crank. So that's how the VVTI is working. That's both for the one UZ and the three UZ VVTI. Right, so the other one that comes out here is gonna be here, and this is your drive-by wire plug, okay? Now, there's four wires instead of two, and that's where the clutch system comes into play. So the ECU is able to engage a clutch inside here on the motor, and therefore it can then choose to disengage that clutch, which would disengage the motor from the throttle blade, and that's how it shuts the throttle down. So sometimes when the throttle shuts down, you can actually hear like a click, and then boom, the throttle blade shuts completely down. That is how the clutch system works, okay? And that's how why you have four wires there instead of two. Two wires are for the motor, two wires are for the clutch, okay? Right, so moving on, and as we go along there, you'll see you've got a clip there to hold the harness in, a clip there to hold, ignore my clips, these are just ones I found lying around, it's just to sort of show you guys how it goes. And as we get down here, you'll then see one of the first new sections that we have put in, and that is gonna be going down to the aircon pump, okay, AC. It is all labeled there. All right, so that's gonna go into your AC pump. So the AC will work on this configuration. Everything is wired up as long as your AC is plugged in gas and all your pressure sensors and so on are working correctly. This one should work 100%, okay? The other one that breaks down through there, goes down through there along with the other new section that we put in, but comes down through there and goes to the crank sensor, okay? That new wire that you can see there that we've added in also breaks out the top here. You can see it over there. And that comes down along there and that's gonna to go to the oil pressure switch. Now then, this is obviously an LS430. You won't have this on an on LS400 1UZ VVTi. Your oil filter will be back here. So this switch is actually facing that way over there, which is why we break it up at the top over here. So you can come down through the hole here if you want and then bring it out there and plug it in over there. And of course, because it's a new section that we've put in, it is obviously labeled as oil. All right, so that's nice and simple. So that's this side of the engine harness done. Let's go to the back because we're gonna do a couple of bits that pop down the bottom there and then we'll make our way along there and go to the other side. So. Coming back to the piece of plastic over here, we then have a section that comes out over there. And first of all, we're gonna have our earth. So that goes into there, which is an M8 bolt. So a size 12 socket on that one. That is your earth strap over there. Also coming out here is gonna be the gearbox plug. So again, it's all nicely labeled there for you guys. And this has the reverse and the speed in for the J160 gearbox. So there's your reverse plug and there's your speed sensor plug, okay. Also coming out here, this one that pops down through over there, and that's going to the Lambda sensor. So I'll pop down here and you can see that plugged in over there. Now, word of warning, there is a plate that goes between the exhaust and the block here, which is designed to protect this plug. Please make sure that that plate is in. If not, there is a power on the ground in here, okay, and specifically important for this customer when we go through what happened. But basically there's a power on the ground in here, and if this plug lands on the exhaust and melts, you're gonna join those together and it's gonna shorten, it's gonna keep popping a fuse, okay. So please make sure that shield is in there to protect that thing. Right, and then that's all that pops out over there. So this is originally where your automatic gearbox would come out. Obviously we removed all of those wires because they're no longer necessary. Which brings me onto the portion you can see over here at the back here. You have one section that pops up there and plugs in over there. So that's your starter solenoid. So you can see the big thick wire there. Your two thin wires are your knock sensors. So let's take a look. So as you go in, you'll see there, it goes along. And then it goes down and plugs into the starter motor. That's your starter solenoid. Then it goes to knock one. And then it goes to knock two. Okay. Now, I want you to pay close attention to that. So back up if you need to. But you'll notice that there's two different wire colors between knock one and knock two. One is gray and one is black. Okay. So as I said in the video, I've shown you which one is knock one. I've shown you which one is knock two. So just make sure you, you pause that part and connect the right one up to the right one. Okay. All right, so that's that section over there. And then lastly, we have our starter cable over here, which we have now, because what we started doing is cutting these down to the correct length and putting a uh, crimp on there for you guys, so it's all ready to go. So we basically measure this, and it's the same length as a 3UZ one, which is designed to come into the battery, which would normally be over here, okay? So that's absolutely fine. So that's that section over there. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna hop around the other side, and let's carry on over there. All right, okay, so. Coming along here, we then have another little breakout down here and that goes to your second earth, okay? Again, to the M8 bolt over there. So just remember, these two M6 bolts, so there's M6 over there, there's M6 over there. That's only on the 3UZ. You're not gonna have that on a 1UZ BBTI. You're gonna have the M8 there and the M8 over there. So those are the ones you wanna tighten down. 
Make sure these are very clean, guys. Aluminium can rust, create like a little powder, and then it can cause earthing issues, okay? So do make sure that you have these nice and clean, okay? You do have access to the M6 holes as well as another M8 hole over there, okay? So what you can do is if you take a look at your IS200, so this is an example of one, there was normally your brake booster pipe that ran along there, which had a bracket, which I think bolted on over there and over there. Anyway, one of those brackets has an earthing strap that you used to have one of those braided earth straps that ran to your one GFE. So you can take that exact same earth braid and then you can just attach it to one of the other M8 holes over there. That's just an extra earth. Always helpful with a Toyota to have extra earths. Okay, right. So that's that section over there. Then we come around over here and then it's gonna break out to go to injector eight and coil eight, nice and simple. It's gonna move along to here. Then we're gonna have a breakout here for injector six and coil six. And then we're also gonna have a breakout for the ACIS or acoustic control induction system, okay? Now obviously this was in a running vehicle, but again, this was a vehicle that was purchased by the customer we're dealing with now. So I would still check that before you put the intake back on again. You've gotta take the intake off to get this harness in on the underside. So while you're there, now just to show you on the plug here, the thick white one is 12 volts. The blue with the white tracer is ground. So if you have this lying on the floor and these colors match your colors, again, don't assume anything with colors on Toyota, work on pin locations. They can change colors sometimes and it can really get people in, in a fix. So in my case, the black one is 12 volts, the white is ground. And what you should hear if you supply 12 volts on a ground to that in the correct thing, because it is polarity sensitive, you should hear the solenoid click. Okay, if you don't, it's time to replace it because you don't want to get all of this back in and find that your ACIS valve is not working. All right, because you lose a lot of low down power, guys. It is quite significant. So please make sure you test that before you put the inlet manifold back on again. Okay, right, so that's that section over there. We're going to move along there and then we're going to go to the cam sensor for the right bank. So this one is measuring the right inlet cam. All right, just while I'm here, remember the VVTI is only on the inlet cam, not on the exhaust cam. Okay, so it's only the inlet cam that can advance and retard the cam. Okay, and then we're also going to go to injector four and coil four. Moving along to over here, we're going to break out in the front sections over here. First of all, we've got our coolant temperature sensor. That's going to go over there. We've then got injector two and coil two. We've then also got our oil control valve for the right bank. So that's going to go in there. And then also this little section that's popping out here is then going to go into our mass airflow sensor. So remember the one you said VVTI for the European LS400 had these type of mass airflow sensors, okay? Do be careful guys, especially in the US, the GS400 did not use this type of mass airflow sensor. It used the small one like on a 3UZ as well as the Crown UZS171, 175. They also use the small math like this. Let me see if I can get it here. Like that. Not like that. I call that the bullet style one because you can see it kind of looks like a bullet. All right, also make sure you get the correct orientation. You'll see this side has got holes in it where air can actually go in. On the other side, it's actually a completely fat, flat base that nothing can happen. So if you've got them the wrong way around, then obviously that will cause the engine not to start, okay? All right, so make sure the right way. And that's it. If you guys wanna just start the engine without the math, then don't plug it in because if you plug it in and you just leave this math lying around, it's measuring no air. And if the ECU is measuring no air, how much fuel is it gonna put in? Zero. Okay, so just make sure if you do want it, the engine will start without the math. It struggles a little bit, but if you don't have the math plumbed in correctly, leave it unplugged rather than plugging it in and leaving dangling there. Because if it's measuring no air, then it's gonna give no fuel because no air equals no fuel. All right. So that's that done. Let's move along here and then we're gonna pop down to here. Sorry guys, it's really sunny today, um, which is unusual for England. But anyway, so it breaks up down here. It's gonna go up to the alternator. So this is a new section we add in. And as you can see, everything is labeled there. So that's your three pin plug for your alternator. Also coming out here is gonna be your low oil level sensor. Now the terminology for Toyota is mole. Anyway, this will have a front sump on in the IS200. So this is designed to plug in over here. Okay, where the sensor is over there. And then lastly, coming down here, we're then gonna have our lambda sensor. So remember, we're only using the two main lambda sensors in the exhaust manifold. We're not using the secondary ones. They're not wired in or anything like that at all. Okay, so that is that, all right. So on this side, you do need to add in a main alternator cable, okay? That's not part of the engine harness. Um, you can use the one from the LS400 if you did get it with your original swap. But that's gonna go down along there now, obviously, this is a bit of a mess, so I'm gonna kind of ignore this one, but I'm gonna show you on here. 
But this is the fuse box that you're gonna have on a right-hand drive vehicle, and that is where the alternator gets plugged into, guys. So that is then fused by the 120 amp fuse. So make sure you plug your alternator in there. The only one that doesn't go there that needs a permanent 12 volt supply is obviously your main starter cable. And that's this one we spoke about earlier and that just bolts directly to the positive of the battery over there. No fuse or anything in between that, okay? That's why we cut them nice and shorter so you don't have a bunch of wire dangling around there. They can get caught on exhaust and melt, etc. Okay, so that's the whole engine harness layout, all right? Before we go into all of the testing, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through a couple of changes we made for the customer in this particular case so he's aware exactly what's going on. So, um, obviously he knows there was a problem with the main circuit for the EFI relay and it caused a melting of a bunch of wires. Um, so, what we've actually done for you, Shane, is in your fuse box over here, which I'm actually gonna show you on the other car because it's easier to see. But what we're gonna do now is, let me get the lid so I can show you here. But you'll see it's your 25 amp fuse that is melted. What we've gone and done is we've bought another uh, fuse box to get a terminal out and we've moved the 25 amp EFI fuse to position number four. So you see one, two, three, and four, okay? So usually there's no fuse in there, but luckily it's open and it's on the same bus that the 25 amp used to get its 12 volts from. So we've put that in there. We've replaced the entire wire from there to the actual relay itself, okay? So we replaced all of that, and obviously we've tested everything. We've replaced a lot of the wires in there. We replaced your black junction connector, because I think that was what was causing your issue. As I said to you, it appears somebody had shoved copper grease um, in that particular junction connector. Um, I'm not sure how that happened, but it was not only on the top half, so not only on this top half here, but also on the underside there as well. And there is a 12 volts right there, and there is a ground right there. Now, again, this is speculation, but I think what happened is the copper grease made a connection between the 12 volts and the ground, and that was what was causing your fuse to keep popping. So fingers crossed, I've tested it out over here. We're getting no more warm wires. Nothing seems to be melting. It seems to be running the engine absolutely fine. So fingers crossed that that was the issue. But just remember that there is still one element we haven't tested, and that is gonna be your interior harness. So the harness that runs across here from the fuse panel over there to the fuse panel over there where you, this harness plugs into, okay? So that's the only section that obviously we haven't tested. So hopefully, fingers crossed, by the time it gets to you, there is only one tiny section that goes into the main section for the circuit that did get um, hot melt wires and, and blow the fuse. So I'm keeping fingers crossed that it's gonna be absolutely fine when it gets to you. Okay, so, but that is super important because obviously you now have no fuse in, 20, in 25 amp EFI and that's moved to over there. So just remember if you do ever sell the vehicle onto somebody else or someone else is trying to trouble diagnose, show them this video so they can see exactly what we have changed. Um, there was a bunch of melted wires in relation to your cooling fans, your radiator fans. We have replaced all of that. So that was in this junction over here. So I'll just quickly show you, uh, where is it? Yeah. So there was the top of that. So you can see all of those three wires have melted together. We've completely replaced it. We've given you a new junction plug and everything as well. Uh, here it is, that'll give you a better idea. So yeah, you can see, not ideal. Okay, and obviously there's the thing full of copper grease in there. So you can see all the copper grease in there. So I'm kind of hoping that that's what caused the wire to melt. As you can see over there, not ideal. Anyway, that's all been replaced for you now. So, and we've tested it up. We've run it up for quite a few minutes. I think 30, 40, even an hour maybe. I'm getting no hot wires with the ones we're getting hot before. So fingers crossed that's resolved all of your issues. Right, so now that that's explained to you, Shane, I'm just gonna pop away and then we're gonna get ready and we're gonna start doing the testing of the harness. So, see you guys in a second. Right guys, so we are back now and we're gonna be doing the testing of the engine harness now. As I said, obviously we can't plug this into our vehicle. Unfortunately, our vehicle is a 98 to 01. This is a 02 to 05, because we can tell that because we don't have the diagnostic port at the front of these relays here for the cooling fans and the AC system. Okay, so we tried it. There are different plugs in terms of the body harness. So unfortunately, we've had to mimic the car as best as we possibly can. Okay, so. We're gonna be doing two sections of the testing. One is gonna be with the ignition on and one is gonna be with the engine running. So let's go through exactly what we can test today and what we are gonna test, and then we'll jump into the ignition on testing, okay? So first of all, immobilizer. So we wanna make sure the immobilizer is removed so that everything will start. Ambient temperature, unfortunately we can't test because obviously we can't plug in the climate controls from there into here. We don't have access to the plugs and because we can't interface this with the body and so on. But what I have made sure is that all the MPX data that we can get is working 
And therefore, if that's working, that's the only other piece of information that's transmitted via MPX. So I'm gonna keep fingers crossed that that is working as well. But it's never not worked if everything else worked, if that makes sense. Next up, we're gonna go over to the dash. We're gonna look at the check engine light, the charge light, and the oil pressure light. So we just wanna make sure that they come on, because remember, the alternator and oil pressure light are communicated via MPX. Obviously, I don't have the oil level plugged in, so the light is gonna stay up on the dash in this particular case, but that will work when it's on your side, again, because I'm basing it on the fact that we've got the alternator and the oil light, which also communicates via MPX, going to the same location, okay. Next up, then we're gonna test the reverse and the speedo. So in this case, I have hooked everything up to the cluster there, so we'll be able to test reverse, make sure we get the beep, so I know the circuit's all completely intact. And obviously with the speedo, again, we'll feed a signal to it to make sure that that is working correctly. OBD2 test, that's just basically making sure that it is connecting, which I have already tested it. We have had to jerry-rig up an OBD2 and plug it into all the wires that would normally come into it, but it is there and it is working. And then the fuel pump relay, we're gonna use our OBD2 machine here and we are gonna test it. And then obviously the AC clutch, AC request, again, because we don't have access to the climate control ECUs, we can't test that. But again, it's a piece of MPX data and as long as everything else works, like coolant temp, alternator light, oil light, etc., I am pretty damn sure that that's gonna work as well, okay? That's with the ignition on, then we're gonna to go to engine running and it's gonna be starter circuit. So basically I just wanna make sure that when I provide the starter wire with 12 volts that the engine starts over, super happy with that. Then we're gonna go over to the ACIS. So all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make sure that this valve does this. That's all I wanna see, it does it a few seconds after startup. If it does that, then I know the ACIS system is working as it is expected to. Then we're gonna do drive-by wire tests and that is a super simple test. All I'm literally gonna do is just rev the engine. So remember, if I move it like this and the engine revs up, that means the drive-by wire is working. If I have to go all the way to this, then I know the drive-by wire isn't working, okay? Then next up is going to be the OCV oil control valve for the VVTi. So again, I'm gonna use my machine. What it's basically gonna do is it's gonna advance and retard the cam. So the engine's gonna sound like a lumpy cammed engine when I do it. And I'm gonna do bank one first and bank two. And it's gonna tell me that both of them are working correctly, okay? Then we're gonna do injectors and coils. So I haven't actually got all the injectors fully clicked down. So I'm just gonna be able to go one by one and then pull them out. And you're gonna hear the engine misfire. And as I put them back, stop misfiring. That'll tell me that all eight cylinders are firing exactly as they should do. Okay, then we're gonna go over to the TACO. Basically, all I'm gonna do is show you the TACO on there and it is being translated by that. So it's being converted from a four cylinder signal to a six cylinder signal. So that should give us the correct reading over there. And I'll give the engine a bit of a rev so you can see it go up and down so we know that that's working, okay? Then we're gonna to go to the coolant temp. So before I even start the video, I'm gonna get it up to about 40, 50 degrees so the coolant can actually start coming off the needle. And then what I'll do is while I'm doing the running test, it should climb up so we can go back again, okay? And then lastly, we're gonna go through the diagnostics, how you do them, what you can do, et cetera, et cetera, okay? All right, so let's jump into the ignition on testing. So this is where it gets a bit fun for you guys, but technically speaking, I've crimped a whole bunch of wires together to imitate what the, what the actual um, ignition does when you turn to the on position. So you'll see I've got two wires going there, that's your coils and your injectors. I've got the B circuit over here because it goes inside the vehicle and back out to the fuse box again. I've then also got another wire down here, which is gonna supply the 12 volts to all of the speed sensors and reverse and all that type of jazz, okay? So then this, it's another part of the section that's there and this becomes my ignition, which goes to my white with the red wire. This is probably super boring, but anyway, and that is that. So once I put that on, sorry. Let me put the camera down a second. Let me just let you guys see what's going on, if you can. Yeah, this is gonna be my ignition, so this is you turning the key on. Oh, in actual fact, sorry for the immobilizer, I haven't shown you that it is actually flashing. <laughs> so, uh, down there, you can see our security light is flashing, and as soon as I put the ignition on now, you're gonna see that it's gonna stop flashing. All right, so let's put the ignition on. There you go. All right, so let's pop over to that. And you can see the security light has stopped flashing, which is fantastic, that's what we wanted to see. So we know the immobilizer is removed. We're gonna skip ambient temperature and let's go check out the check engine light. So you can see that in the top corner there and then we've got our oil light and our battery light over there. So that's absolutely fine. When we start the car, you're gonna see the oil and battery light go off. In the background, I do actually unplug the alternator and the oil pressure switch just to make sure that the correct one goes off so they are wired to the correct place. Right, so let's move over. Let's do reverse and speedo. Okay, so let's move over here. 
Okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put you down on the table here. Sorry guys, I'm rotating the camera. Okay, and then hopefully you're gonna be able to see everything that I'm doing here. So first of all, let me just make sure that you can actually see. So there's the reverse plug over there. And all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a little wire and I'm gonna bridge the two terminals together. So hopefully you can, let me see if you can, no, my hand's in the way there. Right. And you guys have hooked up the reverse circuit to the right, to the cluster so we can hear the beep. So I'm super happy with that. All right, next up is gonna be our speed. So you can see I've got the speed sensor there. There you go. I'm gonna use our standard little device that we normally use. This will output a speed signal for us so we can make sure it's working. And again, I've got my red and my black over there. So my red is gonna go into pin number one. So again, if we're looking at that, it's from the left. So that's number one. Our ground actually comes from the cluster to avoid ground loops, but as I connect that in, you'll see we've got the little LED flashing there. And then what I'm gonna to have to do is I'm gonna put the signal there and it's gonna cause the speedo to work. So I'm actually just gonna literally show you that there. So that's out and that's in. Fantastic, okay. So it's a really nice test because it tells me that the 12 volts, the ground and the signal from these terminals all the way inside the car is working correctly. So I'm super happy with that. Right, let's move over to our list and see what we gotta do next. So after that, we're gonna do OBD2 tests. So again, nice and simple. All I'm basically gonna do is go over to here. You can see we're already actually seeing data. So let me just spin that around. We're already seeing data, so we can see 35 degrees coolant, 21 degrees air temp. Obviously, I have run the engine already to do all the testing and 16% throttle. What we do want to do is we want to go into function. We want to go into system select, so you can see it's actually picking up as an LS400. So that is fantastic. And what we want to do next after that is we want to do the fuel pump relay. So we're going to go into active test. Now it says fuel pump relay and fuel pump. I'm in the description below, I always put this in my videos. I've done a really long video explaining in great detail how the fuel pump systems work on the Lexus and Toyota vehicles, okay? I suggest you go watch that because that's gonna explain why there's a fuel pump relay and a fuel pump, okay? Because it doesn't make sense, all right? But that video explains it in great detail. So do yourself a favor and go and watch that one. So we wanna go into fuel pump itself. We wanna go into there. Now hopefully you're gonna hear it because I'm gonna keep quiet now. Because what we've actually done is, that's actually the feed from your fuel pump coming from this relay box over here. So I've got that wire going into there and then that is then attached to our fuel pump. So I'm imitating the vehicle basically. And I'm gonna turn it on now. I'm sure you can hear that, that's quite loud. I'm gonna turn it off. Fantastic. Right guys, right, so that is the testing with the ignition on complete now. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna get it warmed up. Like I said, I wanna get it to about sort of 40, 50 degrees so the coolant starts coming off the needle on the gauge. And then what we'll do is as we start the engine up and everything, then it's gonna get warmer. So what I'll do is before we start the engine, we'll take a look at the dash, see where the coolant temperature is, and we'll come back at the end when we do the coolant temp over there, and we'll see that it's actually risen as the engine has got hotter. So let me do that. See you guys in a second. Bye-bye. Right guys, so now we are back. You can see I've moved the thingy. I've got all the crankcase ventilation hooked up properly to the thingy, so the map's reading correctly. So now we are ready to test. You can see that we are now at about 52 degrees, so the coolant temp is just slightly off the needle there. Let me just come over to here. Hopefully you can see there the coolant is just off the needle. It's just, just above the cold there. So what we'll do is as we started, obviously, when we get to the end to look at the coolant temperature, we'll actually see that, that has risen. So we know that's working correctly. Quick recap of what we're gonna be doing. So starter circuit. So again, I'm imitating the key. So there's your starter wire that comes from the ignition barrel. I'm gonna give that 12 volts. That's then gonna cause the engine to start over. That means all the wiring inside there for the neutral start switch is taken care of as part of the manual swap. And we know everything is working 100%. Then we're gonna move back over to the engine and we're gonna do two quick things. First of all, we're gonna check the ACIS, that that's gone down like that. And we're gonna rev the engine up to make sure the throttle is working in the drive-by wire. We'll come back over here, we'll test both oil control valves via this. And then we'll go over and we'll remove each injector one by one, which will then cause the engine to misfire and then pop the injector back on again and make it all nice and smooth. Then we're gonna go over to the dash and look at the taco and the coolant temp and we'll pop back and do the diagnostic. So without further ado, let's crank her up. So again, this is your starter wire that comes from your key barrel. I'm gonna give it 12 volts like your key barrel would do. Works 100%, there you go. Okay, so, there you can see that that has gone down. It's a super 
super happy with that. Super happy with that version of the get go. Right, let's move into our active test now. without a fuel pump that's how long right so let's move over to the diagnostics over here okay so obd2 is your best tool without a doubt it's going to give you tons of information that you're not going to get otherwise okay and if you look at over here there are going to be five codes in total that are left over that cause absolutely no running issues they do not even cause the check engine light to come on so you should have noticed that on there you saw the oil light and the alternator light and the check engine light go out while she was running All right those codes are Bank one sensor two, bank two sensor two. So those are the secondary lambda oxygen sensors. They're not even connected. So therefore you're gonna have those codes. Again, doesn't cause a check engine light, doesn't affect performance. Don't worry about it. The last three are gonna be SLU, SLT, and SLN. Now those are related to automatic transmission. Again, it's the ones on the J, like the GS300 and that, we have to put those big resistors on in order to remove the codes. Because again, on those ones, it causes a check engine light. On this one, doesn't cause a check engine light, doesn't affect performance so you do not need to connect them and we don't because obviously it saves you money and also it saves you having to build a little plate to put them on because they get incredibly hot so when they're not needed we definitely do not put them on okay but those are the only five codes you should ever have on this ecu okay everything else is taken care of um, with the atomy device and the wiring that we do okay so again absolutely no other codes apart from those if you have another code it'll cause the check engine light to come on the dash and you treat it like any other vehicle it is going to then mean you've got to have a look see what's causing the check engine light and fix the issue okay now this is obviously the best way to do the codes it's not the only way to do the codes luckily for us europeans and japanese with the ls400 one uz bbti or the celsius one uz bbti we have the luxury of being able to read codes via what i call the flash code system where you can get the check engine light to flash okay so in this particular vehicle, right, you'll see on this relay over here, box over here, there is actually a place for it, but there's not a diagnostic port. That's a 2001 slash 2002 to 2005 model. If you have a 98 to 2001, you have a diagnostic port on the front here. Okay, so again, this is its general information for you guys. So you can read the flash codes by bridging E1, so you can see it's that one over there, and TC, which is that middle one over there, okay? If you've seen it in other videos, you've seen me do it like that loads, okay? So you can do that. What you can also do is you can bridge your OBD2 port, all right? And it's pin uh, 4 and 13 or 5 and 13. They're, they're directly above each other. Basically, 4 and 5 are both grounds. 
and 13 is TC. Okay, so in this case, this particular customer will only be able to do that. He can do it with a paper clip, and what's gonna basically happen is it'll cause the check engine light to flash, okay? And it becomes like Morse code, so you basically read it like they're in groups of two, so it'll be like one, two, three, pause, one, pause, one, two, three, four, pause, one, pause. So that would basically be three and one, 31, and four and one, 41, okay? You always group them into sets of two. There's no single digit codes. So as an example, code 31 is the mass airflow sensor, but there's two codes related to the mass airflow sensor because the mass airflow sensor has a built-in intake air temperature sensor. So if you disconnect the math, the codes that you should get are 24 for intake air temperature and 31 for mass airflow sensor, okay? There's a bunch of other codes. I've got a whole list that I can give you guys, so do not stress about that, but that is a way of doing diagnostics without a machine. Only problem is, which is a good example, is it'll give you code 14 and 15 for ignition or, or a misfire. The problem with that is what they've done at Toyota is because the old 1UZ non-VVTIs worked with two igniters, one feeding four cylinders, other feeding four cylinders, and it had code 14 and 15, they kept that same legacy system. So basically what it means is if you get a code 14, it's one of four coils that could be misfiring. On this thing, it tells you exactly which coil is misfiring, okay? So again, that's why this is much better. It gives you much more in-depth information, but if you are stuck and you don't have a machine and you wanna see what's causing your issue, you could narrow it down to four coils if you've got a code 14 or a 15, but at least if you've got a code 31 and a 24, you know it's your math sensor that's causing your issue straight away, okay? Right, so that is basically it, guys. Um, this is, again, a hard wire job, and we don't do a lot of these, but if you guys are interested, like I said, this is basically the reason we do these particular ones is if someone has already gone in and messed around with the wiring. So the problem with our plug and play setups is they are exactly that, they are plug and play. Now, if you've messed around with these two plugs that came in the IS200 originally, and you've messed around with these plugs underneath like it was in this case, obviously we can't create a plug and play harness for that because we don't know what's been changed and what's been connected again because some guys might connect some things but not other things that are relevant to this particular situation so we do offer this as a service um, we can take the entire engine bay harness i must warn you it is not easy to remove and I'm, this customer can contest to that it goes from here all the way along here obviously i've chopped mine off but it comes all the way down here goes to the headlights it runs all the way along the back over there under the battery, goes into this fuse box, which is why you see we've got that on the table over there. Runs all the way along here, and it goes to the cooling fans and to the headlights over here. And then on the inside, to make it even more difficult, it then plugs into these little fuse boxes down here, and it plugs in right at the back on both sides. There are those fuse boxes there, okay? So... If someone has already tried to do a UZ or whatever conversion on your IS200, yes, we can fix the issue, but there are caveats, and that is that you need to send us the entire engine bay harness that we can then work with that. And basically, we'll hardwire it in. So this particular engine harness would never work with an IS200 again. We've removed everything IS200 related, and we've wired it directly to a 1UZ VVTI. So just bear that in mind, Shane, if you want to move the vehicle on. This cannot be put back to a... Um, to a uh, 1G FE. It has to run the 1G VVTI, or because we've taken care of all the stuff and we have the paperwork, if the next customer wanted to put a 2JZ GT VVTI in, we most certainly could build the patch harness and everything from that, because at least we now know what is connected and what is not, because we have all that paperwork, which a lot of the guys that do these conversions, unfortunately, they don't keep a lot of detailed paperwork, so you'll never know exactly what's connected. In our case, you can give us a shout. We can obviously have all of that paperwork ready, so if you want to change it, we can create a plug and play harness now with this one. Okay, right, so thanks for watching, guys. Bit of a long one, because obviously it's a lot of stuff that we've had to go through today, so I do apologize about that, but if you stuck around to the end, we'll get you those photographs, you'll see exactly what we were sent, what we did to it all, and what it looks like at the end when we're finished. But if you guys have any questions, please feel free to ask down below in the comments. Uh, you can also find us at Phoenix Engine Management on Facebook. Um, just a quick heads up, uh, if you find Phoenix Engine Taylor, that's a profile that was set up to start a business profile. Um, I'm never on that. <laughs> so if you do send a message to that, you might wait like two or three weeks for a reply from that. Um, but yeah, that one, don't use that one. Go to the business page, Phoenix Engine Management, and you can message us there. You can also email us at info at Phoenix Engine Management as well. I'll put all of those details down in the bottom for you guys. So when you go into our videos, you can find us and where to contact us. Okay. But thanks for watching. Let's get all this boxed up and off to Shane so we can have the uh, fun, fun task of putting all of this back in the vehicle again. Thanks for watching, guys. See you again later.
fight, never quit, do it right, play the game, win your life, have no shame, there's no time, feel the pain, let the grind, I could change, in my mind, pick a lane, commit and climb, the only way, to win it life, I never miss that stack, taking big swings, jam to the back, put me in the ring, you'll go out in a bag, cause I sing what I mean, and I bring it to the mad life, ain't got time to kill, I got time to fail, I took the red pill, I know life's short, so I wanna live real, but how's it supposed to feel?